And we are live. Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome to our really awesome webinar. It is the second to last day of Women's Month. I am so glad to have all of you with us. We're going to have a really, really good conversation. And I have to say, I love all the comments that are already coming in through the comment section. Even before we started, we saw some of those comments coming in, people introducing themselves. I just love that. Everybody go introduce yourself. Tell us where you're checking in from, where you are in the world. And I also, I'm going to ask you questions throughout the whole conversation so that you can be part of this. I know a lot of you are watching on YouTube. We are also streaming live on Facebook and on LinkedIn. So you can find us in all of those places. But hopefully what you can do is make this into an active conversation, not just a passive one. If you've ever been to something that I've hosted, you know that I love to talk to you all in the comments, to share what you're talking about, what you're saying with each other, to really make this into a dialogue so use that space, say hello, use this as a networking opportunity, and welcome, welcome. We have a really, really good conversation in store for you. I'm going to pull up some slides so you can see what we're all talking about today. My name is Beth Santos, and I'm founder and CEO of Wonderful. If you're new to the Wonderful community, welcome. If you haven't heard of us before, I want to take a little time to introduce who we are. We're hosting a conversation today all about what travel can learn from travel advisors, which is this really amazing space of the travel industry. Some of you, I'm sure, are travel advisors. You're going to be able to school us all in some of your favorite tips. Others, this is completely new. And so I'm really excited to get you all on the same page to start talking about this and to bring in a really awesome expert. It's Henley Vasquez of Fora. She's going to give us um, some, some really good tips from her years of experience and also tell us a little bit about what she's doing with Fora. But first of all, let me just say, because I'm going to be one of the last people to say this to you, happy Women's History Month. We've got two more days of Women's History Month. We have been celebrating hard over at Wonderful, doing all sorts of things to celebrate what it is to be in a woman in travel. If you are not a woman in travel, you're still welcome here. We want you all part of this conversation. Women's issues are everybody's issues. So this is something that all of us can be part of, all of us can talk about. We want you to be present, engaged, chatting with us. And also I'm gonna share with you, sorry, I'm having a little bit of fun with all the, uh, the moving things around. I'm gonna share with you the slide because it's really good. This is all of our social handles. So take a screenshot or do the old fashioned thing where you pull out your camera and take a picture. This is where you can follow us all on social media, on Facebook and Instagram where she's wonderful. Um, Fora is at hello Fora. So make sure anything that's interesting to you, go ahead and share it during our conversation. Share quotes, share pictures. We wanna hear that you're here. We want you to be part of this conversation. I think you're gonna really like what we have in store. And I see some really awesome comments coming in. Catherine's from Asta, which is great. I'm excited for you to be part of this as well. I'm seeing Globetrotter from Oman. Beirut is in the house. Firenze is in the house. Seattle is here. Oh my gosh, Brooke is also in Seattle. Justine's in Toronto. We have such an international community here. I absolutely love it. California, Oregon, New Orleans. So welcome everyone, continue to be part of this. And the other thing that I want you to do as we get situated is I want you to give us a little bit of information about your own background. Do you, are you a travel advisor yourself? What are you coming in to get out of this conversation? What are you hoping to learn more about? Because I want to make sure that we're addressing that, that we're leaning into some of those topics that we're talking about those things. So go ahead and, and drop into the comments. What brings you here today? What are you hoping to get out of this? And let me tell you a little bit about Wonderful while you're doing that. Wonderful is an international collective of travelers and travel content creators, and we're on a mission to make travel better for all women. And when I say all, I very much intentionally mean all. It doesn't just mean arming women with pepper spray and sending them on their way and teaching them how to travel. It also means looking at what are some of the issues in the travel industry that are holding women back? How can we make sure that women are rising in leadership roles, that women's voices as content creators, as small business owners are being amplified, and that we're talking about a variety of intersections of women and not just one type of mythical norm of woman that we see a lot of times when we search on the first page of Google. And so here's a little bit of, of 
kind of the stuff that we do. We have a membership community, 50 global chapters all around the world, as well as an online network of women who are helping each other, offering tips and advice. We also run a number of events. WITS is our travel creator summit. We host it every year in a different city. We also run the Bessie Awards, which celebrate women of impact in travel. Those are both coming up in May. We're going to be meeting in Kansas City and love for you all to attend. And then this March, just this month, we actually launched the very first Wanderfest, the first major outdoor travel festival by and for women. We brought together hundreds of travel loving women to downtown New Orleans. If any of you were there, I want to hear how much fun you had. It was so good. We had such a good time. And we're all about bringing women together both online as well as in person, disrupting these narratives, pushing the travel industry to do better, connecting one another and being support networks for each other. And I know that you'll get a lot of that when you see more of what our community has to offer. And by the way, I want to say we're going to be here for about mm, an hour. You know, we've got until four o'clock Eastern time to be together. We will not go over that. I'm very you know, militant about making sure we're on time with stuff. But I want to tell you to stick to the end because if you stay to the end, we've got some really good insider tips. I want to tell you about something that Fora has made available to us to skip their wait list. They have a huge wait list of travel advisors right now. We'll talk about that. You'll get instructions on how you can skip to the front. So if you are interested in being a travel advisor, definitely hang out to the end. This session is recorded. So you can also come back and watch the recording anytime. Just go to this link on YouTube and you'll be able to get in there. And I want to give a moment to everybody who's commenting now because there's so many good things. Catherine is interested in learning more about Fora. It's on our short list for a host. Brooke has a dream of running food and culinary tours for mobility limited folks and is mildly mobility limited from MS and would really like to make the world accessible. Brooke, I love that. Michelle is co-owner of Waldron Travel in Charlotte. We're luxury, luxury travel curators, new to the industry, always looking to learn. And members of Wonderful. And you guys are all also business brand partners of Wonderful. So thank you for doing that. The getaway teacher is a teacher who loves to travel, wants to learn more about being a travel advisor. I hear a comment that Wanderfest was so much fun. Yes, it absolutely was. Shay is a new travel advisor and travel writer and wants to learn more from other like-minded individuals. Uh, what else? Wants to be a travel advisor and learning all the travel things. Oh, this is good. We have such a good variety of attendees here. I hope you get so much out of this. Continue asking questions and participating. And now I want to get to the good stuff, which is the root of our conversation. So what I'm going to do is bring in my co-fireside chatter. So imagine this beautiful fire right in front of me. And I'm going to have Henley come to the other side and we're going to talk. But first, Henley, I'm going to give you some bragging points. And then I'm going to brag about you. You don't have to brag about yourself. And then I'm going to bring you in. So let me introduce Henley to you all because she's absolutely amazing. Henley Vasquez is the co-founder of Fora, a new startup that empowers anyone to transform their passion for travel into meaningful revenue through flexible and fun work. She's built her career through fostering meaningful relationships and developing opportunities for her community. A self-proclaimed hotel junkie, Henley is driven by matchmaking the perfect property to each travel's unique style. Prior to Fora, Henley founded and led Passported, a boutique travel agency with a focus on making travel both accessible and enjoyable. She earned her chops in Indigare and also contributed to National Geographic Traveler, Departures, and more. She lives in New York City with her three kids and her rescue dog. Henley, I'm going to bring you in here. Welcome, welcome to uh, the little fire. Well, hello. Thank you so much for that nice introduction. I'm blushing. If you can't see Aww. <laughs> isn't you know sometimes you just have to do that like you just pump somebody up a little bit and then we've got like the music in the background like mm -hmm. da -da -da, as you come on stage yeah so <laughs> thanks for being here and taking the time to to give us all your insights thank you so much for having us and also yeah i will say that um we women are probably the worst at bragging about ourselves but we're really good at pumping up others so i just i'm so thankful to be here with you and love everything that you built and excited to chat Aww, thanks henley well you know it's funny the the last time we did a webinar it was on International Women's Day on March 8th. And I brought in Nikki Vargas, who is the editor of Unearth Women, which is this awesome um, feminist travel publication. And she's also an editor at Photos. And we had this tagline that developed during our conversation, which was normalized flexing. So <laughs> that's what we're going to do today. We're going to normalize flexing because, yeah, right, like, we all have to show our chops from time to time. And you're right. Women don't do it as an, enough. So we're going to either do it for each other or, you know, we're going to like. <laughs> 
push each other to do it for ourselves. Well, and we have a really good conversation planned. I know there's a lot of people here who are either new to travel advising, experienced in travel advising, don't even know what travel advising is and are curious and more. There's a, and for me coming from a space of not a lot of exposure to travel advisors and what they have become, you know, when I think of a travel advisor, first of all, I think of a travel agent, right? So that's what we used to call them. And second of all, we there's this kind of picture, I think, that a lot of people conjure when they think of a travel advisor, which is like a cute little old lady in a, you know, brick and mortar store somewhere oh, down the street. Who, Yeah. So like, tell us, like, you are dedicating your life to this space. Why? So, and look, I'll say that I think that is the vision that a lot of people have. And so although travel advisor is kind of the way that the the job has been rebranded because it sounds a little bit more like wealth advisor or like home decorator, like I often will say I'm a travel agent because then people immediately know like, oh, you book what travel. it means. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they understand yeah. what it means immediately, even though it's a little like passe to say travel agent. And then I'm a travel agent. Um, and yeah, it's what I've done for the last 15 years. But I also fell into it by accident. I came into it through a content standpoint, realized like the best way to monetize content was by actually booking the stuff that you were writing about. Um, yeah. And and by doing that, discovered this entire world that I think most people don't realize exists. Um, and that is the world of travel advising. So it is a world of people who spend their time thinking about beautiful destinations, planning trips to beautiful destinations, discovering them themselves, um, and really bringing their friends, family, and like extended client networks along. And that was sort of what initially attracted it to me. I didn't grow mm. up traveling a lot. I didn't grow up in a family that had the means to do lots of exotic travel. And so sort of as an adult to have this job that enabled me to see a lot more of the world really sort of opened up things um, for me. And once I found it, I was hooked. Well, and you you alluded to this, but, and a couple of people have mentioned in the comments, like I've never really thought about, you know, travel advisors in that way. And it's, I think one of the biggest surprises that I've, come to know, you know, as I've gotten to know this industry even more is that travel advisors are not only not just, you know, the little old lady with like the big book and the brick and mortar. It's like a huge part of the travel industry. It still is. It's leading a lot of the direction of the travel industry. It's a what hundred, I wrote this down somewhere, hundred billion dollars, yeah. hundred billion dollars in bookings in the U S alone is yeah. coming from travel advisors today. Yeah. Like these days. Yeah. And, yeah. and I think that's really surprising to people. A lot of people, when you say I'm a travel agent, I'm a travel advisor, they say like, what? Those still exist? Isn't yeah. That isn't that dying? Online? Yeah. And it's, well, and there's a few reasons that that's not the case. One is that if you are booking any sort of complicated trip, like you could spend lots of time falling into a Google hole, trying to, you know, figure out the difference between two towns in Tuscany, or you could have a travel advisor who will do it for you. And by the way, is going to get you the same price that you would have gotten on your own, but they earn commission from the trip. And that is how they support their businesses. So there's not actually a higher price point. And usually once somebody's figured that out, it's a done deal. Um, they save themselves time. Somebody else does the work and generally knows better. So we have an extensive network amongst each other that we have anything I haven't been. I know somebody else who has. So we can sort of like pull back the layers a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing that I think people don't realize is that when you're talking about a travel advisor and you're talking about high end travel, so not necessarily the budget stuff, not Airbnb, but we're talking about high end travel. When you, if you were to say book yourself, like, oh, I could just go online and I could book myself a Four Seasons or, you know, any sort of hotel like that. If a travel advisor books it for you, you're actually going to get a better deal. You're going to get breakfast. You're going to get spa credits, upgrades, all of that. So again, part of what drives this hundred billion dollar industry is the fact that once you get hooked into it and you realize you're saving money, not losing it. Yeah. Yeah. And you're prioritized better than the people that booked through online because the the hotels prefer to work with travel advisors versus OTAs. You start to sort of realize there's this engine. It's this kind of silent secret engine in the industry that's pushing a lot of travel sales forward and really isn't in the forefront. Like you won't see on the subway, you'll see booking.com advertising on the subway about what a great trip you can book. What you won't see is the person talking about how they did book a trip through there and then the pandemic came and they lost all their money and there was nobody there to help them and they're trying to sort out right. where to go now. And that is where right. we come in is we are like the little humans in the background that are actually <laughs> driving a ton of money. <laughs> they're actually making the system work. No, and and you've, you've dropped so many good little truth nuggets that I wanna make sure that everybody's catching as you're throwing them out. You're like a rock star throwing t-shirts out into the audience. <laughs> One of them you said is that, you know, 
oftentimes travel advisors don't cost more money. In fact, they cost less because of the savings that they're giving you because of the perks that they're getting. And so this is the thing that blew me away that I didn't know um, about travel advisors at all that you alluded to as well, which is so travel advisors actually make the hotels the most money out of any other way to give a hotel money, which is very valuable. You know, I come from a space of supporting women in travel. So a lot of things I'm thinking about is women-owned businesses, about places that are that are um, paying women equi equitably for their work. So say you're like, you know, and, and the other thing I'll say, and then I'll stop, is that I also see travelers as investors in the travel industry we want to see, right? Like yes. we do not spend money like we do in travel. When I'm buying a toothbrush, I spend Five dollars, two dollars. You know, when I'm paying for a trip, I'm spending a thousand dollars. That's an angel investment. Yeah. You know, so so as travelers, we are angel investors in the travel industry. So all this to say, if you want to be very thoughtful about where your money is going, and you're saying I really want to support, you know, woman-owned business, minority-owned business, a travel advisor can actually get them more money than anyone else because they're taking a much smaller cut of commission than um, a an OTA, a booking.com or an Expedia. Expedia or booking.com, they're taking 30% commission from the hotel. Travel advisors are taking less. They also cost less money than even the hotel's own marketing because the amount of money that the hotel is spending to get customers to their page, they actually spend less money on the customer that a travel advisor would bring. So basically, Travel advisors create this really magical ecosystem where you're supporting a small 72.5% of the time woman owned business mm -hmm. by supporting a travel advisor. The travel advisor is supporting the business more. And because the hotel really loves what they're doing, they're giving them extra perks that they can pass on to the travelers because they're like, thank you for bringing us customers who are awesome customers. Here's an upgrade. And so it's like creating this whole ecosystem of giving that we often don't think about in the travel industry. We often think about like how much can we cut out, not how much can we give to one another. So I think it's really, really magical, honestly. Yeah. And I think it really, it's, it's, we, we are thoughtful about our spending for travel. Maybe think, maybe we buy carbon offset credits for our flights, or maybe we choose a hotel if we care about sustainability that we know is, is sort of doing better things for the world. Um, that hundred billion dollar number sounds really big, but it's really all small businesses and mm. almost every single travel agent, unless they're in-house and within a very large agency, which most of them are, it's really independent contractors and independent contractors are essentially, they are, they are women and they are small business owners. So it is their business, the business that they bring in and that they deliver to hotels and that they get paid for. That is their small business that's paying for their kids' dental bills or summer camp or their mortgage. And so when you're routing your money that way versus routing it through Expedia, you really are making a conscious spending choice. So yeah. this is how I'm going to use my money. I'm going to get an equal or better deal for my money regardless. So how am I going to spend it? And I think that, that that's a really interesting way of looking at the equation that we often don't look at it. It's like, you know, it's sort of like looking in a, in a shop and saying, well, am I going to buy something? Am I going to buy that book from Barnes & Noble? Am I going to buy it from the bookstore right. on the street? Well, right. the book is the same price either way. I'm going right. to go support the small business. And from a travel perspective, that really is what you're doing. You're making a choice to support often somebody who you know, somebody in your neighborhood who's doing that work. And then you're you're helping them sort of support their passion and support their their job. Yeah, I love it. And Marie France is saying kind of what uh, supporting what we've been saying, which is 20 years ago, I thought about being a travel advisor, but was told nobody would pay for the service because you could just research and book things online. I, and I remember that, too, when it was like, oh, the Internet is coming. Are people not even going to use travel advisors anymore? Are they going to be cut out? But it, we've actually found that not to be the case at all. No. Well, and it's almost the fact that there's so much information on the Internet is what has made it so hard. It's like. I, it's a little bit like, you know, when you get like, you've got like a rash on your arm and you like web MD it and then suddenly you're like, oh, I got a leper. Like, it's so oh, scary. no. <laughs> and it's the same thing with travel. There's almost so much information out there that it's information overload. So the Internet doesn't have it may have the right answer somewhere in there, but there's a lot of answers. And there, yeah. and it's not somebody the Internet doesn't know. Uh, well, like 
you're a person who likes boutique hotels. So I'm going to tell you that this is right for you. You're a person who likes like polished high luxury hotels. So I'm going to recommend this for you. What a travel advisor does is actually get to know you and match make you. Um, I talk a lot about matchmaking. I feel like that really is. It's like you're setting people up on a successful date and you want it to go really well. And so you like want to make sure that they jive with each other. Um, and so the internet doesn't do that. The internet just delivers yeah. you information, it delivers you prices and it delivers you availability and that, and it delivers you like lists of restaurants and tour guides and all of that. You may not know. And I found this particularly for me with traveling with kids. Like if I want a tour guide of, you know, the Met Museum here in New York, do I want one that's going to like be good with kids or do I want them to kind of like babble away in academic talk? Like I, I don't want that guy. I want, I want the yeah. one that's going to keep my kids entertained because also my attention span is about the same as theirs. So travel right. advisors can help you match up with that. If you Google best tour guide, New York city on Google, I mean, like who knows what kind of information. Yeah. You're getting. Yeah. yeah. No, I, completely. And I think you raised this excellent point, which is there are so many, you know, before it was like, we don't even know where to start in our searches. Now there's so many answers when you search for something you don't know. And I, you know, I, I always think about this experience I had once, which is like a good metaphor for this. I went on Groupon one day and bought myself a restaurant gift card as like a little gift for myself. It was one of those, you know, last minute, super cheap things. It was to this Lebanese restaurant in Chicago. I driving to the restaurant, look at Yelp and I see like literally two star reviews. Like <laughs> everybody hated it. Service is horrible, you know. And so I'm going, okay, I'm going to manage my expectations. My husband and I go, we have a date night. It is the best experience ever. It is oh. basically this little tiny hole in the wall Lebanese place run by this one guy. He's literally like running the front of house, running the kitchen. He curated all the art. All the art is like Lebanese artists. We go in, we show the Groupon. He's like, forget the Groupon. I'm going to get you whatever you want. He just brings food out for us. And I realized in that moment, the problem with a lot of these aggregators, which is if you're looking for fast service and American friendliness, you're going to hate this place. Yeah. Yeah. If you're looking for a moment to travel to a new place outside of your home, you're going to love it. And, yeah. and it was like, it hit me that, you know, yeah, if you have certain expectations about a certain type of experience, then, you know, these aggregators are only going to give you so much information about what you're going to get based on your expectations. It takes a human sometimes to be like, oh, you want to feel like you're leaving Chicago for a day? Let me take you to this place. You're going to feel like you're transported to Lebanon. The service is really slow, but that's what you're going to get when you go to Lebanon. So it'll be real, you know, like, yeah. and then so and like having that human side of it makes a really big difference a lot of times, you know? Yeah, and it's having the human side and having something, sorry, I'm like moving around in the light because I'm uh, <laughs> you know? trying not to catch the <laughs> glare, yeah. Um, the, the, I think the human side of it too is something where often that human has done those things. So, you know, there's like, you don't really know who that person is on Yelp. Like, did they walk in intending to go to some other kind of experience? Whereas like when you're talking to somebody, it's more like talking to a friend. So my example of that is there is a place, Arenal, which is the, the, the volcano rainforest area of Costa Rica. Like lots of people go there. Costa Rica, food is good, but then it's like it's pretty similar everywhere you go. I found a place up there that is a, an Italian woman who moved to Costa Rica, married a Costa Rican guy. He's obsessed with aliens. Like he believes UFOs are real. He thinks that they have a language. They have a pizza place that is in Arenal and it makes the best pizza I've ever had outside of Italy. Like oh my God. Oh, it's incredible. Right and it's in this, it's in a house. Like you would drive right by it. You would never even notice it. And now I tell everybody to go there and they're always really that. happy to have like a change in the cuisine because they've been eating a lot of the same stuff. So they go <laughs> and they have incredible pizza and it's like painted in like alien stuff. Like he, he painted like <laughs> UFO writing on it. Like it's really crazy <laughs> and he really believes it, but it's so quirky. And that's the kind of thing that you're not going to like find that on Yelp. Like yeah. you have to have somebody say to you, I went there and yeah. this is what it's like. And let me yeah. manage your expectations. Like here's what yeah. you're in for. And when right. somebody can describe to you an experience or describe to you a hotel, you're like, you're primed for it. You're not just looking at anonymous reviews of like somebody yeah. who went in and said, this place is built by a net job. Aliens aren't real. And like you're telling someone, you're going to have the best pizza of your life. And it's in this crazy setting and like enjoy. And so I think there's a very different experience when it's person to person and a person who has been there and experienced that thing versus anonymity, anonymity and aggregation of like lots of opinions that you don't mm -hmm. know where they come from.
And that's one of my favorite parts of travel, honestly. It's the, not misadventures necessarily, but just the cheeky, funny, unexpected, you know, things that happen. And I think being able to get a personal recommendation like that with, with that kind of premise of, okay, hey, by the way, it might be a little bit funny, but you're going to love it. The pizza is so good. You know, that's, I love that. That's so awesome. Well, and again, it's all to me about putting the human back into this experience and the OTAs, the bookings.com, like what makes them a great business for like big hedge fund investors that they have no religion. They're just about volume, like just book, 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 book. And what I like is that we're putting the human back into it. We're saying, actually, we do have a religion. We do have beliefs. We do have feelings about places. Like there are hotels that evoke emotions in people. There are you know, good and bad, by the way. Um, but yeah. there, we are putting the human and the emotions and the like authenticity back into the planning process. And I think particularly given what we've all gone through in the last two years, that feels important now because a lot of these communities, like when we talk about small businesses, women as travel advisors, like let's talk about the small businesses in these places, like the bartender who hasn't gotten a tip in two years or yeah. the, you know, safari lodge that can't donate as much to conservation because they haven't had tourism. Like tourism matters, yeah. Um, and these are small businesses yeah. in these places. So like we should have some emotion about this. It yeah. shouldn't just all be just bang it out and book it. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Okay. I want to ask you some questions specifically related to women, because yes. I think this is the other thing that's so fascinating to me. So, so for those of you who are not familiar with this information, I'm going to drop some more truth bombs here. Number one is women across the travel industry and in, in the world of travel as consumers completely dominate. We make 80 to 85% of travel decisions. That means 80 to 85% of the time, it's a woman who is booking a flight, you know, deciding where we're going on our family vacation, et cetera, et cetera. Now, one of the things that I often talk about, and I think a lot of those who are from the wonderful community and coming in, you hear me talk about is the fact that even though consumers are huge in the travel space, travel as a larger industry is really lacking women. It's really lacking diversity in leadership and in how we talk about travel and how we represent travel. We find that the travel leadership is still very white, very male. We really focus in, on topics like safety and fashion, and that's about it when we talk about women in travel. And that there's a need for much more of that lifting women's voices, lifting a diversity of women's voices, bringing more women through the pipeline into leadership roles. Now, all of that being said, I remember I had this conversation with you and I went, gosh, you know, it's really hard being a woman in, in the travel space. And you kind of turned your head and you said, really? I have not found that. <laughs> <laughs> and what we realized is that, and then I started doing some research of, okay, well, you know, which one of us is right? Well, the travel advisor space is like this magical land where it's predominantly woman led. 72.5% of all travel advisors are women. Yeah. What do you have any idea like why? <laughs> Can you answer for the segment of the industry? I wish I knew the secret because I feel like, you know, there's a lot of other industries like, you know, I mean, the men have been running a lot of other stuff like that. Ah, maybe, maybe the women could have done a little bit better. Um, so it's, I think there's a few things at play. So first of all, it is very much a female led industry. So the, the sort of like legendary big travel agencies that have been around for a long time, they were all started by women. Uh, and this is back in the day when like women were not, you know, having the careers that that we're having now, not having the same access. Um, but I think the bigger thing now when you look at it is that women in particular mothers have when you have children, you may take your maternity leave. You may come back to your corporate job and then they may say like, oh, like, well, we're going to put you on this project. You get a little mo you can get mommy tracked very easily. And I know that there's lots of talk about equality. And let's be real. It's not really happening. Let's say you, that you're in an industry that's just very hard to balance. Suddenly, you do have to go to a pediatrician's appointment or your kid gets sick or you have to let them. I did like right before we got on this, I had to let I'm at home right now and I had to like buzz my kid in from school or fix a pair of broken glasses. That is very hard to do when you're in a very structured job. The thing about travel advising is that it can be done from anywhere. In fact, it should be done from anywhere. Like you shouldn't be sitting in your office all the time. You should be traveling and selling travel while you're doing it. You should be going on your vacation and emailing your clients and saying like, I'm at this really special place. I think it would be really good for you. It is by definition, a more flexible remote job that was happening long before remote work became a thing. And so it naturally attracted women. I also think that if you like, 
if you sit in any cafe, you will probably find women just naturally doing this job. They sit around, they talk to each other. I just went to this place. It's so great. They're sort of planning each other's trips and their book clubs and their spin classes and their, their coffee. Anyhow, a lot of them aren't getting paid, which is really the genesis of Fora and saying like, let's get them all into the industry. But it is it has just become a place where women talk and plan and, and sort of direct the travel spend. And I will say, as somebody who has not worked in a male-led industry, it's just it's like a totally wild thing. I don't have to think about the same things. I don't have to wonder if I'm getting paid fairly. I mean, I may feel like I want more commission, mm -hmm. but I'm getting the same commission as any other woman or man in the room. Um, I don't have to think about, is there a man that I'm not going to be able to get past to get to the next level of my job? It's a woman I might have to get past to get to the next level of my job. So it's just a great equalizer. I mean, I think even when the Me Too movement happened, that didn't really affect us as in the same way because like, we're the bosses. Like it's not, it's, yeah. there wasn't a thing going on where we had this sort of like heavy level of discrimination and difficulty that happened to women in a lot of other fields. So it's been, it's, it's, it's weird to be somebody who spent like a long career in an industry where you're just not really impacted by a lot of the stuff that goes on in almost any other place. Again, 70, what was that? 72%? So, yeah. 72 and a half percent. Don't forget and that half. Half. Like, And I can tell you, I just came back from a conference in Italy and like, you know who I was talking to all day long? Ladies. Ladies who are at the top yeah. of their business, the top of their job, really good at what they do. And lots of them mothers as well. Well, and, and maybe I answered my own question with the question because you know, we just talked about how women are making 85% of travel decisions. We didn't necessarily talk about who they're making those travel decisions for, you know, and so there's, there's a little bit of this conversation of, you know, mental labor, right, of yeah. the, the amount of mental and emotional labor it takes to plan a trip. Yeah. And the fact that, you know, if you're doing it for your family, I can't, I can't charge my family, I can try, I'm going to try <laughs> to charge them, but I won't. Um, but there is labor that is being done, not always just for our families, for ourselves, where we're kind of leaving money on the table because we've mm -hmm. been doing this stuff for free, even though we're creating value for other people as yeah. the bookers. And so this move into, you know, becoming a travel advisor, there's a very natural connection actually there. Yeah, it, it really is. It's a very natural connection. What has made it unnatural in the past is that typically you couldn't become a travel advisor unless you were going to do it full time. And there's a lot of people who might want to book their own family's travel, might want to book their friends and families and sort of like professional networks travel, but aren't going to say, hey, I'm going to sell a million dollars worth of travel per year. It's what I'm going to do full time. It's something they want to do between drop off and pick up or it's what something maybe they freelance and they want to do this as their side hustle. So typically prior to this, it was hard for people to get in in this sort of part-time manner, even though to me it made perfect sense as a part-time job, sort of you eat what you kill. You want to make more money, sell more travel. You don't want to yeah. work as much, sell less travel, like a little bit more flexible because nobody's paying you that salary. You're really building your own business around it. Um, so it's quite an obvious place where a lot of people are doing uncompensated work. The trick was just trying to figure out how to turn on that, that compensation. Yeah, no, and, and and I think that's a really important point to bring up is the full time versus part time of all of this, and I think that also plays into. There's a couple comments right now that are going in the comment section about DEI, about accessibility, about who can actually make a career out of this, and yeah. I don't think it's a surprise that you know for for a business like that. I mean, people who are travel advisors, they are entrepreneurs. I have said many times that the only people who can afford to be an entrepreneur and no offense to any white men in the room that are listening, but the only person who can afford to be an entrepreneur in the way, you know, society suggests entrepreneurship, which is you drop everything, you focus entirely on your business, you eat ramen every day, you invest every dollar you have, you invest every dollar that your family has. The only person who can do that is the person who has so much capital to begin with that they can afford to lose everything and still come out okay. And that's, you know, white men, unfortunately. And so, so there's this change, I think, that we need to have in our startup ecosystem, in the landscape of entrepreneurship in general, which is allowing people to move into the space without risking every little tiny bit of life that they have. And I think yeah. one thing that's really neat that, and we can kind of scoot into some of the stuff they're doing specifically with Fora, because I think one of the things that's interesting about how Fora is approaching this is as this doesn't have to be your full-time job to start. This no. can start in a place of 
a side hustle. This can start in a place of, you know, building your portfolio and then you transition it. So you're not taking on a whole ton of risk up front and it makes it more accessible to anybody who wants to take on a career like that. Yeah. And there shouldn't be. So I totally agree with you. And I think this whole one of the terms that I hate the most in startup culture is it's a lifestyle business. And people say that mm-hmm. as though you're saying it's a pile of poo on the sidewalk. Like it's <laughs> lifestyle business. <laughs> Oh, it's not big. And I think, well, what's wrong with the lifestyle? What's wrong with mm-hmm. creating a business that like would actually fund your lifestyle and that you might like doing? Um, so I think that like lifestyle business shouldn't be a bad word, first of all, for people who want to start a business. Um, but the other thing is that, that yeah, like people may have other jobs. And so I had a really interesting conversation with one of our advisors who had actually a lot of our advisors never knew they could do this job. Um, but one, she did know and she had tried and she is a real estate agent, which is you know so similar to what we do. And she had found an agency and she talked to them and they said, great, so you're going to you're going to quit your job. You're going to take a multi thousand dollar training course and you're going to figure out how to sell right. for yourself. And right. she was like, but I, I can't I can't quit my job. Yeah. Like, I need a <laughs> I'm young. I don't have parents paying yeah. my bills. Like I gotta, I gotta work. Uh, and they said, well, you, then you can't work with us. And so that to me felt like such a like, well, but like in what world can somebody just throw all their stuff away and go into, again, this is like, this is not a salary job. You can get a job at a travel agency, but if you want to be an independent travel advisor, you have to build up your business. You have to build up your clients. That doesn't happen like that, even for very well-connected people. So to expect that somebody can drop their normal source of income and just jump in full force is a little bit like, well, okay, so let's talk about who that's really going to work with. That's only going to work for people who are quite wealthy anyhow. Um, The other space that I've seen a lot of people come in from is women who are going through divorce, where they have been a Mm -hmm. stay-at-home mom. They have been out of the workforce for long enough that they don't really have a skill set. It's not that they're not capable of it, but like most companies are like, uh, you've been a mom for the last 10 years. Um, And they don't, so they don't have a clear path, but they know they need to start earning income again. And this is sort of this natural way to sort of use like, actually... I have a network and I've just got to figure out how to use it. But again, that is not somebody who can say like, cool, I'm going to show up for this. I'm going to put all my money into it. It's going to be, you know, 12 hours a day because they've still got other stuff going on. So I think we really have to be a little bit more flexible in terms of how we approach people's sort of work and not act like it's not work. It's not a work ethic issue. It's a matter of how do I pay my bills? What are my bills? Like how much do I want to work? And then also give people a chance to sort of, control that lever a little bit. So make more, sell more in. And I've seen people do it and they go from little and then they're amazing. And then there's other people who say like, actually, like I got to scale back right now because maybe I've got something going on in my personal life. And like, I actually really need to focus a little bit on that. And I can't do a bunch of this, or I have another job that's ramping up. So that balance and allowing people to control it a little bit feels to me, like from the point of view of like women in the workforce, really important. Yeah. And there's some great comments that were coming in as you were talking. I want to bring this one back to the screen that Justine did, which is hope we can get more communities communities at different intersections of identity to do this work to provide more relevant experiences. Hundred percent. And that is one place where I will say we, as an agency world, we are very female forward. We are not as diverse as we should be. And when you're talking about sort of relevant experiences for all people, often you do want to talk to somebody who has that similar choice. So when you talk to somebody who's in the LGBTQ community and they're traveling to a country where they want to talk to somebody and say like, am I going to feel out of place with my partner there? Or you're talking to somebody who's, who's a parent and you want to know what a parent is like. You're talking to somebody and in any culture where they're going to a place and they want somebody to talk to them about what is it like to be. And so we actually had one of our advisors was featured in USA Today today. Um, she, USA Today today, she is a paraplegic and she has traveled the world in a wheelchair. If you, that is not somebody who is usually featured when you're talking about travel stories. If you are talking about, if you are a person who has your own disability, do you want to talk to somebody who walks very comfortably on two feet and can go up a flight of stairs? Or do you want to talk to somebody who also has the same issues? And so I think getting better representation within the travel advisor community is of the utmost importance. Like like inclusion is good business because you're going to actually be able to serve more people in an authentic way. And you're giving, I say giving people voice, like people don't have a voice already, but giving people the spotlight, right? Who who can speak authentically and speak from their own perspective to other people. I know one of the best um, things that I ever heard at any conference ever was by Disha Dyer, who was a speaker at WITS, our travel 
Blogger Conference. And um, she is the former social secretary to President Obama. She um, started a nonprofit called Be Girl World that takes girls, um, high school age girls from Philadelphia and DC overseas. And she was talking about how, you know, one of her biggest tips for content creators and bloggers and influencers is don't try to speak for somebody else. Yeah. You know, if, if you want to bring in somebody's perspective, have them share their own story, you know, bring people's, the best thing you can do is pass the mic onto somebody else and give them voice. And I think that that's, that's something that I know Fora is working on really hard that the whole, I think travel advisor space can do more of that can be a super advisor, super advisor, super power for advisors. <laughs> yeah, we super advisors. Right. Let me, yeah, they're super advisors, but it's like, let me give you my experience and, you know, and use my voice to help you with your travel experience. Cause we're all different. We're all going to come from different, different expectations, yeah. different wants, different needs. And if we can have, this really incredible, super diverse community of, of advisors who can speak from their own personal perspectives and build businesses on that. I think that's really special. Exactly. I mean, that, and that's one of those things that it's being a travel advisor is a sales job. And it took me like really a long time to admit I'm, I'm a salesperson because I don't think of myself that way, but it is, it is a sales job. You are selling travel to people. Now, what makes a good salesperson? Somebody who believes in what they what they're doing, and somebody who is speaking sort of from a place of of authenticity about what that is. And so, to say that you know I've been there, I've done this, I am like you, and this was my experience is a much better sales tool, frankly, than somebody who's like reading it online and going like. Yeah, no, 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 totally. Like racism is not a problem there. Like you need somebody who is actually saying, I have walked in your shoes and I can tell you how it's going to go and I can help you plan this. And that is why, again, like great that we have so many women, but like we, we do need to like mix it up a little bit more. Yeah. I want to talk a bit about Fora specifically, because we're getting a lot of questions in the comments of people who, some people who are like, I just signed up for Fora and I'm trying to oh. get more, which is awesome. I'm seeing some people that are saying, you know, that they're really curious specifically about Fora. And so I want to make sure I'm giving you some time to talk a little about this journey too, of like, why did you start, you know, we just talked about how the travel advisor space is so big, but yet there are huge holes right now that we're seeing. Why did you start Fora? What are you trying to get out of it? Tell us more about it. Yeah, like why would why on earth would a person start a travel business during a pandemic? <laughs> travel? I mean, I wasn't gonna say it like that, but yeah, you know, well, it's you're gonna walk into it. it. Why would you do something like that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't have any self-preservation instincts. Um, well, you know, it was just luckily I have a really wonderful co-founders, and we just, you know, we all had a similar idea of like love this industry, love the travel space. I saw travel coming back. I knew that when it came back, it was going to be more complicated than it was in the past. So really, it was last summer sitting around and going like, OK, travel advising is a job that is more important than ever. A million and a half more women are out of work at this after this pandemic. Remote work is up. People want flexible flexibility, great resignation. They don't like their jobs anymore. Like, isn't this all intersecting to say like people want to travel and it's been a long time? It's complicated to travel. They need human advice, not online. People want interesting work. They want part-time work. And we've got an industry that is an aging industry that hasn't really innovated either with technology or even like really in the way that we expect people to work. And so we sort of, that was, I guess that was just the foundation of it, of saying like, what can we do that would be different? Now, in a lot of ways, we're the same. We're a host agency. Our advisors are mostly ICs. They book with our IATA. We help them get better perks. We train them. We give them sort of resources. We have a really wonderful community, which I know is so important with you guys about that our advisors are always talking to each other, helping each other out, figuring out destinations. Um, where we're different is that we're creating a set of tools where they're going to be able to manage their trips, book their trips, research their trips a little bit more easily. Travel technology is kind of an oxymoron and we just don't really have it. Um, so we started by just giving them really beautiful profile pages. So anybody, you sign up, you get in, you get a profile page. We're going to do the SEO. We're going to help people find you. So you should develop your own leads, but also we're going to help you get some business too. And we're going to be there to support you once you start booking it. But then it's really once you get into the nitty gritty of booking travel, it's stuff that like I do so naturally because it's what I've always done. But if you have never done this before, suddenly you're going, what's an IATA number? Like what's the, what's the commission? What's the net rate? Like what do all these things mean? And that's where we're trying to create a really nice set of tools for one part to ease the booking process 
and then on another part to really help them able to market themselves more easily, even though they're still in the process of learning. And I think you you raised a really good point of a couple of things that are coming up in the comments of some people who are new and kind of like, how do I start? How do I build? Let's see, hold on. I actually starred one. Aisha had, had a really good question. How to market and get clients, you know, how to build your portfolio. And these are all, you know, I'm sure you could drop something in like 10 seconds to be like, here's how to do it. But also these are ongoing things that you have to learn, you know, over time. And I think one thing that I love, I'm a for advisor myself. And one thing that I love about it is there's whole portal with workshops every week you're putting on, okay, here's how to, you know, market your travel advisor business on Instagram. Here's some destinations that you might want to know about and some properties that you can look at. You're really, you're not just saying like, here's your IATA number, here's your booking number and go off into the world. Yeah. It's like, yeah. we are going to give you the tools to actually build this as a business. And because a few people are like, well, how much does this cost? So I want to say like, it's free. <laughs> like, okay, she's like, no. Which again, people are like, why? <laughs> What's wrong with you? Um, yes, it's free. So the way that a travel agency works is when you book something. So Beth gets a client. Beth goes off and books her client in a hotel. That hotel sends a commission to the agency. The agency keeps a portion of the commission and then sends the rest to Beth. So that is why kind of in the same way that we don't charge clients for the bookings because we get paid commissions, we don't charge our advisors because we keep a portion of their commission. So we provide support, training, tooling, all of that. We keep a portion of the commission. Um, we give a, I guess, more generous than normally it would be for people who are booking at low levels. But we really try to support people getting the business because we think that there's a lot of opportunity here. And like, look, this is a, it's a business. It's a passion project, but it's also a business. Obviously, we want it to be successful. Um, but we think that by making our advisors and the sort of giving them the best chance at their success, that's how we're going to be successful. Um, so no, there is no, there's no fee to join. I think that question though is really important about how do you find clients because that feels really scary. And again, like when you first get into it to go to people and go like, I'm the best travel agent, book your hotels through me can feel kind of like, oh, like that's kind of a lot. So I do mentoring calls with our advisors. And one of the things that I tell them is like, just be honest, just say to your friends and family, this is what I'm doing now. I really like, I would appreciate if you support me, you're not going to spend more money. Can you please book your hotels through me? And that is something that is, that is so important. Um, just to sort of be honest about what you're doing, be honest about how you make money. And then we do do trainings with our, um, our Instagram, our social media person. So she actually teaches people how to do better posting. We give templates for people to send out, we create content. So we try to give them a better way to do it, but also it is about just like, coming out and saying to your friends, like, help me out, support my business. Well, and I think it's, you know, so I teach a, um, a blogging and content creator 101 workshop at the travel and adventure show and a few other places. And, and I think the answer to that is actually kind of similar to the answer that I give on at that show, because in both ways, as a new travel advisor, as well as as a content creator, you're kind of carving out a new business, you know, you're very entrepreneurial, you're starting out. And the number one thing I say is like, really get a good understanding of who you are, what your, you know, knowledge is, what your niche is, what you're good at, what you're not good at, like know really, really well what you're not good at. Yeah, exactly. And and then lean into that stuff because we're in a world where there are, there are a lot of bloggers out there. There are a lot of travel advisors out there. You don't want to be the person who does everything. No. Because then no. you do nothing. Right. Yeah. So like really carving out that niche of if you're looking for, you know, the specific type of travel experience, I can help you. But the other thing I really love is that because there's this whole network and this whole social platform that Fora uses, if you don't know, you know, if somebody really does want to work with you and you don't know the answer, you can just ask somebody else for advice and totally. you can actually use each other. So it becomes a community at the same time. I think that the importance of community can't be like underlined enough because we're like we're in this together. And so. Yeah. That is that is the kind of thing where like, you know, look, there's there's a lot of experience in a community. You don't have to have been a professional travel advisor for 15 years like I have to know things about places. So having a community where, you know, you can ask a question and nobody thinks it's a dumb question. Nobody says like, oh, my God, you haven't been to Positano 10 times. Like I haven't been to Tesla <laughs> sometimes, like knowing that you have people who can help you out, that you've got searchability. So you can go back in and go like, I know somebody asked about Positano. Like, let me see if I can find it. And that like you have that support to figure figure out how to do your job is really important because when you're just thrown in there and you're on your own, then it's like, like it's overwhelming. There's too much information. Then you're there in the Google hole yourself. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. And uh, my computer, because I am so in the sunlight. Right now. Sorry, guys. This is, I, I will tell everybody. The light. I know I'm quarantined at home because I tested positive coming back from Italy and my kids are upstairs and my dog. And so I'm like hiding. This is real life right now. <laughs> we were just talking about how real life is like the norm nowadays, you know, that like everybody, if you don't have a kid running around in the background of your Zoom call, who are you? Like what yeah. kind of person? And actually, I will say this is interesting about marketing, then that is actually, it's part of your marketing as a travel agent. Like I will find something to connect with anybody on. Like you got a dog, let's talk about the dogs. Like let's talk about, you know, how you brought your rescue dog back from another country. You got kids, like I'll tell you about mine. You love to like, you know, binge eat pasta, like me too. So finding those things that you can connect with when you have a new client are the ways that you sort of figure out how to sort of how to, how to start planning, how to get in with somebody, how to get to know them, because clients do tend to become more like friends than just like yeah. anonymous people. And you need to know them in order to really plan for them. And part of knowing them is like they like caring about them, knowing their family, figuring out what their preferences are, what their like quirks are. Um, and that is that is very much part of the sales tool. So being a people person is really that's it. Mm hmm. And by the way, so, and like so many comments are coming in, so many questions are coming in. I love all of you. I love all of your questions. I'm going to pre-apologize that I can't answer, get all of them answered today. But I will also say, because there's some really specific ones that are coming out, like, you know, about the logistics of, of, of how to do this. We're going to talk about how to sign up so that you can right. get that. But also um, for other remaining questions, the Fora team is really fantastic, honestly, at answering those questions. So if you come in and apply, there's a process where you can actually ask questions. And then there are all sorts of workshops and things that you can do to build. So you shouldn't know all the answers right away of how to build an entire business. That's something that, you know, takes time. But absolutely, you can you I think that's one thing I really love about this is it does make this so accessible. It's not just saying here's your number and, you know, go off on your way. It's really trying to make this something that anybody can do with the, the number of hours that you want to do if you're really willing to, you know, put the work in like an entrepreneur would. Um, there were there was a question I want to make sure I answer, which is two people ask, is Flora for men only, which are no, it's not men only, women it. only. Oh, we love men too. I, I know. Love, I saw that. <laughs> I love that you asked that question because I wish more people would ask that about travel. Like, is this really, is there any room for men in this space? Because it's so focused on women, which I love because that's not usually what I hear all the time. So yeah, yeah. usually it's like women being like, can I get a job at that can place? I so much, you know, we don't right. we love men. And actually our yes. office has a lot of men in it and there are men <laughs> in the travel community. And I will say you really stand out as a guy. If you become a travel advisor, like you'll be, you'll always be remembered because there just aren't so many of you. And again, I actually, I think like, Look, we're, I like we're obviously talking about opportunities for women, but like get as like as a guy, get in on this because there aren't so many, and you can really carve out a niche in whatever you know. <laughs> if you have a specific, like they're gonna want to plan their bachelor parties with you. <laughs> like there's there's a lot of things for men to do in this, so I definitely don't um, don't mean to sideline the guys. We like the guys as well. No, I love it though. I, I have said before, I'm like, you know, we always talk about women's travel as this cute niche, but really men's travel is the niche. Go get it, men. You know, <laughs> so you're right. No, this is anybody can, anybody can do this. Just anybody can do this. Anybody, anybody, anybody. <laughs> um, so tell us, you know, for people who are dying to know how to start, you know, what to do next. Yeah. So it's Where super straightforward. Um, if you would like to become a travel advisor, you would sign up, just go to foretravel.com, sign up there. We do have a very large, I think it's about 10,000 people wait list at the moment. So sign up for the wait list, but in the, you're going to get a survey emailed to you. The survey is going to ask you a bunch of questions about travel. It's sort of how we figure out if we think like you've got a chance at being sort of successful at this. Make sure that you mention wonderful in the where you hear about us section, because that we're going to keep an eye on that. And then we'll put those up to the top of the list because we are working through this as fast as we can, but I will be honest, people can get a little bit buried in there. Um, so put that in there and also feel free to reach out on any of these questions. Like I saw somebody asking about like, how do we handle invoicing? Well, you don't have to deal with it. We deal with it for you. So a lot of these kinds of questions that I think are typical of other agencies, a lot of that stuff we sort of offloaded onto our in-house team and we don't expect our advisors to deal with so much admin stuff. So we can walk you through some of that if you're thinking about like how these things work. Um, but just make sure if you are signing up in that wait list that you do put wonderful because otherwise it's going to take us a lot longer to get to you. It is. It's a really long wait list, which is great. I know. Great for you all. A great was, problem to have. It's a champagne problem, yet it's, it is still a problem. Yeah, it's a 
a champagne problem. It's still a problem. I love it. Well, and I know we've just got five minutes left to go. I want to make sure that we end early, if not on time, because um, I know people have places to be. So I just want to hear some advice, advice on for anyone that's watching this, who's thinking about, you know, making the jump and becoming a travel advisor. Also advice for our industry. Like what should, you know, what should travel be thinking about to make this a an industry that's more inclusive in the way that that travel advising has become in a lot of ways. I mean, give us, give us some knowledge here. Oh gosh. There's so much pressure. Uh, you know, I think the thing that I fall back on so many times when I'm thinking about why do I like this industry so much is how much it's a relationship business. It's so much about like, getting to know people, developing relationships with your clients, with your suppliers, with your advisors. Um, I, I would just want to see that continue to grow. I want us to know more about each other. I want us, I want hotels to not be anonymous. I want to know who owns it. I want to know who are the stakeholders in that place. If we're talking about conservation and impact travel or um, low impact travel, I want to know who's staying there. I want to know like all of this stuff. I think we should just continue to build more on this relationship and really sort of like open up the curtains a little bit and say like, these are who we are. This is, you know, we're not just sort of anonymous Marriott. We're not just anonymous booking.com, but really sort of, again, bringing the human back into the industry. I think we are all craving human connection after staring at each other like this so long. Um, so I hope that that continues to grow. And I will say for anybody, whether it's becoming a travel advisor or starting a business or doing any of that, like it's, it is damn scary to jump into something new. Um, I wake up in sweats with a stomach ache at 2 a.m. many nights and go like, oh my God. Um, but this is, it is so exciting. And it's such a fun time yeah. to be in this. It's such a like changing, never boring, wonderful people kind of industry. And I just, I want to see more people involved in it and less, um, and less big corporations going and handling all this business for us. So I would just say jump think later. A jump, jump and think later. I love that. And <laughs> let's humanize travel. That's the other thing I'm getting from you. Like yeah. normalize flexing, humanize travel, you know, make it so that we, it can be for and from, from all of us. You know, yeah. I think that's the important thing. Henley, thank you so much for taking time. Thank I just you. put the, the slide back on the screen because some people are like, what's the website again? So, and actually everyone who RSVP to this event, you're going to get an email in two minutes. And it's going to have a link that you can use to click. Um, a couple of people are asking, Henley, I don't know if you know the answer, but for the sake, because I know a few have Let's asked, see. they said, if I signed up months ago, can I sign up again with the one? Sign, sign up again. Yeah, do it, yeah. Do it again. Okay. <laughs> do, do it again. again, just to be safe. We don't want to miss you. So yes, do it I'm again. Sorry. Sign up again. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah, I know. It's okay. We're going to we're gonna get you up to the top of the list. So don't you worry. Um, Henley, thank you. It has been a pleasure. I appreciate you taking the time to share some insights to everybody who was participating and sharing comments and sharing your perspectives. I appreciate you all. You're amazing. I'm wishing you all a great, wonderful rest of your day. And I look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thank Thanks, you so much. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye.